The title of my presentation is called The Three C, focusing our efforts on three clean energy challenges. And the reason why I, I, I'm very deliberate in that title is because we will have accomplished something about, regarding the 2012 Green the State House event if you come away with some real clear takeaways and some real clear calls to action. In my observation of clean energy discussions in Indiana, I, I sometimes perceive there to be two very divergent groups, and that's not to mean that there aren't other uh, camps in Indiana. But on one extreme, so to speak, are those who believe that the clean energy situation we're facing in this country is a nightmare. And they base that claim regarding global warming and climate change. They look at maps like these, uh, showing dramatic changes in surface uh, icing in places like Greenland, they look at the uh, unprecedented incline in uh, carbon dioxide emissions, and they're worried. On the other hand, are people who focus on uh, a closer net uh, metric of air quality, traditional pollutants that we've regulated over the last 40 years, and they see a declining trend in these pollution levels. And that, too, has accuracy in that we have seen, in general, the improvement in our air quality in Indiana and across the country. Our view is let's acknowledge the good, but then also confront the challenges. And this is where I come up with the three C's, climate, coal ash, and clean energy. Those are the three things that I hope will be the core takeaways from this presentation. Let's have a quick recap on progress. Maps like these are called attainment maps, and they indicate what counties are and are not in compliance with various federal air quality regulations. Generally speaking, we've seen some really great improvement in our air quality, like I said, and, and only a few pockets of Indiana continuing to be in non-attainment for certain types of air pollutants. Now that can be challenged, I, I know, uh, in terms of methodology, but by and large, again, air quality is improving in our state. The second source of progress to acknowledge is that the dirtiest coal plants that exist in Indiana are finally retiring. You've got a, a, a coal plant in, in Gary, Indiana that was run by NIPSCO that, uh, that recently was virtually shut down this, this year. But there's also Gary, Gary plant. There, and there is another power plant uh, that is operated by uh, uh, Indianapolis Power Light that will likely retire in a couple of years' time uh, in, in Eagle Valley in Martinsville. Uh, there, there have also been shutdowns of coal units operated by Duke at, at Gallagher and at Wabash, and, uh, and also a likely shutdown of some units at Tanner's Creek operated by Indiana Michigan Power. The bottom line here is that some very dirty coal plants are either shut down or will be shut down within the next few years, improving air quality, reducing the carbon footprint. So that's something that we have to acknowledge. The other thing that's happening is largely driven by federal air quality standards being uh, methodically tightened over time is the modernization of the other part of the coal fleet. And you're finally seeing uh, reductions in mercury that are going to happen over the next uh, two to five years thanks to federal EPA uh, safeguards that are being implemented at the state level. Again, a source of progress. Now, you might say, well, that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. But, but and maybe some of you did, but what I want to do is talk about three things that I do feel, uh, that we feel at the Hoosier Environmental Council are three great challenges that continue to face the state. What I call the three C's, climate, coal ash, and clean energy. We've talked, obviously, Dr. Filippelli talked at great length about climate change. This powerful image comes from none other than central Indiana. This is an image from the Morris Reservoir, and it shows just the damage that has been done by our drought, uh, the, most, the worst drought that, that Indiana has faced in 24 years. And yet, to be honest, we've had a trouble lack of moral urgency at the state level. And what I want to do is point out a few things that give us backing for this point. One is the fact that Indiana does not have a climate action pl plan. And what you see here in this, this very helpful map, which was published in Indiana Living Green a few weeks ago, is Indiana lacking a methodical plan to think about how we're going to deal with the, both the mitigation side of our carbon problem and the adaptation side of our climate problem. Secondly, our state environmental agency, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, if you were doing Google search this, as I did this morning, 
and type in climate change, you won't find any copy on the IDR site. You will find a couple of mentions of climate change in some PowerPoints back in 2009 and 2010, but actually they contend, they make claims regarding climate change that are contrary to what Dr. Filippelli uh, had characterized as, as, uh, as the general view on where uh, scientists associated with the National Academy of Sciences are. And, and if anyone has any doubt about that, please visit the IBM website. And finally, on the image on your right, on my right, your left, is that of Edwards Port, the very controversial coal gasification plant that will be probably in operation sometime next year. This is the newest gasification plant uh, in uh, Indiana and uh, one of the largest coal gasification plants in the country. The problem is it's being claimed as a clean coal plant even though it has no carbon controls on it. So there's a troubling lack of moral urgency. Our call to action is to try to muster new voices to get involved in trying to address climate change at the state level. And here we focus on clean energy businesses, religious communities, and farmers. These are three groups of Hoosiers that ought to be more mobilized to address this. The second challenge we face is coal ash. This is a stunning image. We have more than 50 coal ash ponds in, the, in Indiana, which is by far the largest in the United States, even though we're the 14th largest state in America. These are acres in size, and they contain all sorts of toxins in them that if they are of a certain concentration level, could be carcinogenic. The problem is that while there is a great deal of self-regulation happening by coal utilities, virtually every coal, electric coal utility in, in Indiana has had violations of some type of water uh, contaminant. And again, we are happy to furnish uh, research on this point too. But our call to action is that there is going to be a continued effort as there literally has been last week in Congress to try to derail future safeguards to protect our drinking water from coal ash that are happening at the federal level. And uh, we'll hopefully we'll talk about it in our late afternoon session. But this is something that we really need our supporters to get behind, which is to protect coal ash safeguards. Finally, clean energy you might say, why are we considering this a challenge? And the argument we make is that Indiana isn't doing enough proactively to foster more clean energy investment in Indiana. One is that there really aren't any meaningful renewable energy incentives when it comes to commercial scale renewable resources like wind farms, such as those you see on I-65 and you will see on I-69. Uh, the statute on the book, SEA 251, simply doesn't incent new commercial scale renewables. Secondly, we think that there's a risk that Indiana could lose a couple of really innovative programs of clean energy, something called the demand side management order, which we'll probably talk about in our Q&A, and feed-in tariffs. These are areas where we can actually acknowledge progress in Indiana, where we've been leaders in the country in trying to foster energy efficiency and renewable energy. The problem is that there are risks of these, both these programs getting dismantled. And we want to make the public aware of that. Because I'm out of time, as has been pointed out, I'm just going to briefly flag the three policy initiatives that we'd like for people to be at least aware of as you uh, stay in touch with us in 2013. One is possibly amending SEA 251 so that it truly does become a meaningful driver of renewable energy investment. Secondly, urging utilities to not chuck their energy efficiency and feed-in tariff programs, which are very innovative. And finally, to seek the adoption of this policy called clean energy, uh, property assessed clean energy bond, which was the focus of my presentation last year.